Take a pack of cards, cut them, shuffle them, and deal them out. We can play games with them, create magical illusions, or use them to see into the future. But are they just an innocent pastime or a device of the devil? Playing cards were everything that God had forbid. People walk up to me and say, you know you are doing Satan's work here because he lives in those cards. From the Templar Knights to the priestesses of voodoo, the history of the playing card is a tale of mystery, mysticism, and the dark arts. What lies hidden in their numbers and symbols? And who holds the secrets of the playing card? The future may be written in the cards, but their past is not so clear. The origins of the playing card are the subject of fierce debate. There are conflicting stories that tie the playing card to India, to Persia, or to slave soldiers from Egypt. But most experts believe playing cards developed in China, alongside other games such as dominoes, and Mahjong. The first definite reference to playing cards occurs in China in 1294. China, as a nation, was the inventor of many, many items outside of playing cards. Certainly invented paper, invented printing on the mulberry bark originally. And there are similarities seen between today's cards and those found in China 800 years ago. There is a further support in the fact that the earliest Chinese cards known have got coins on them. And the, the Spanish European cards have got, of course, coins as one of the suit signs. But it's almost impossible to trace the earliest history of playing cards. Obviously, the cards themselves haven't survived. They are far too fragile and ephemeral. Especially after printing was invented, you played with a pack of cards. When they became dirtier, you took a new pack of cards and threw the old ones away. An alternative theory believes that cards may have been invented first in Persia. From there, they spread east to India and China, and west to Egypt. And it's from Egypt that experts believe playing cards arrived in Europe. The cards from which European cards can be shown to have derived are cards from Egypt of the Mamluk Empire of the 14th century. Mamluks were originally a race of slave soldiers imported from Turkey and Russia and trained as cavalry to fight for Muslim armies in Egypt. In time, the Mamluks became a powerful force and gained control of Egypt, establishing strong trading links with southern Europe. Trade is the main um, way through which the playing cards arrived in Europe. We, we can imagine that Traders in Alexandria, fascinated by this new game they saw, and um, finally they um, brought it with them to their native countries. The Mamla cards show intriguing similarities to modern day cards, very clearly showing four suits. They are swords, polo sticks, cups or goblets, and coins. These represent the interests and pastimes and occupations of the Mamluk aristocracy. The game of polo was known to be popular among the Mamluks. And the sticks, or the batons, which later became clubs in modern uh, playing cards, appear to be a direct derivative from that. At least that is one of the theories. The other Mamluk suits, swords, cups and coins, are exactly the same as those that are still used in Italy and Spain today. And once playing cards had arrived in Southern Europe, it seems they traveled fast. Well, a sign of their popularity and spreading is certainly all these records we have, either laws against gambling or simple uh, princely accounts. In 1377, a Dominican friar, John of Rheinfeld, wrote of the appearance of playing cards in Switzerland. And accounts belonging to the Duke of Brabant in Belgium 
noted a high outlay for the purchase of new packs. Fifteen years later, in France, there is a record of a Jacquemin Grigonneur being paid 56 Parisian sol for gilded cards for the king. This spread seems to have been very rapid and very massive. So one of the historians in Germany uh, has used the, the expression Spielkarten Invasion, invasion of playing cards. It's an appropriate expression as armies traveling through Europe were one of the most important carriers of the playing card from one country and culture to another. Much easier to carry a pack of cards around in a soldier's knapsack than a, a chessboard or a backgammon board. Historians believe these traveling armies were almost certainly responsible for the eventual arrival of playing cards in England. The beginning of the 15th century saw the latter part of the Hundred Years' War between England and France. So it seems more than likely that playing cards must have come from France into England in that part of the century. And finally, the playing card was taken across the Atlantic to America, also in the pockets of soldiers and on the boats of explorers. Cards were taken up and appealed to uh, Native Americans too. They didn't have the wherewithal to produce printed cards on paper themselves, so you get leather cards with their own suit symbols and their own designs on them from the earliest days of colonization. In fact, the early design of playing cards shifted and changed considerably as different cultures were keen to stamp their own identity on the pack. For example, in Italy and Spain, cards continued to mirror the Mameluk design with swords, batons, cups, and coins. But the German suits instead reflected the greater importance of the countryside in their culture, using acorns, hawk bells, hearts, and leaves. People who were painting and designing cards in Europe were casting around for symbols that were easy to do and pretty to look at, but and based on something they had already seen. In France, Card makers decided on a more radical redesign using very simple symbols. The French invention of using two colors only, red for the hearts and diamonds, and uh, spades and clubs in black, was really a very convenient commercial consideration. This allowed the French card makers to make cards in a simpler way, but with a better paper, a better quality, a better readability. This experimentation in France was a success, with the result that their designs became the basis for the modern Anglo-American pack. And the major suit systems which we now know today all became established by the end of the 15th century and have not greatly modified since. The influence of different cultures and customs has also determined the design of the court, or picture cards. Early packs had no queens, reflecting the idea that the royal courts were a male-dominated world. One of the earliest detailed accounts described the pack as follows. Four suits, 32 cards, um, 13 cards per suit, and three courts. But the courts he describes are a king and two marshals. No queen. To this day, Italian, Spanish, and German cards have variations of the three male court cards, but still no queen. The exception to this rule is the French design, which does include a queen. There are many explanations for this. A traditional one is that uh, the French are courteous people and uh, French gallantry as um, um, translated into the playing cards with the queen, which is perhaps not untrue. By the end of the 14th century, the pleasures of the playing card were causing a stir throughout Europe, and their appeal cut right across cultural and class divides. Worried that their distracting influence would lead to an increase in gambling and immoral behavior in the lower classes, church and state felt compelled to intervene. 
determined to control the sale and use of playing cards. Their efforts revolved around two of life's certainties, death and taxes. When playing cards were first introduced to Europe, they were handmade, expensive, and used mainly by the nobility. This soon changed. As cheaper printing methods were developed, playing cards became more widely accessible. But the growing popularity of card games inevitably brought with it an increase in one of the oldest pastimes known to man, gambling. Up to the end of the 18th century, people never played at anything without gambling. So gambling was intrinsically um, tied to the playing cards, of course. In the playing card, with its sheer variety of packs and games, gambling had found its perfect partner, much to the dismay of the clergy. Overall, the church did everything it could to stop gaming with cards. And in fact, some of our earliest historical documents are sermons against using playing cards. The church began to issue strongly worded edicts, restricting and sometimes even forbidding playing with cards. One of the reasons why gambling was prohibited was obviously that it led to a lot of dishonesty and a lot of crime. The ban on the cards was because they caused drunkenness and fighting among the people. Over the next hundred years, examples of these edicts across Europe reveal how the playing card was viewed as an evil and sinister influence. The city of Florence passed a statute on gambling in 1376, forbidding the card game known as Nabe. Two years later in Germany, it was declared that gambling with high stakes was punishable by a fine. St. Bernardine of Siena took it even further. Bernardine of Siena preached against gaming at Bologna in 1423 so persuasively that the populace consigned their cards in thousands to a public bonfire. In England too, church and state considered playing cards a scourge on society and were quick to try and control them. In the 15th century, Parliament supposedly forbade the playing of cards, except on the 12 days of Christmas. In the 16th century, Henry VIII complained that too much card playing was distracting his bowmen from their training. Then in the 17th century, a group of card makers petitioned the king to grant them a royal charter. Charles I, who was uh, keen to find finance to fund his uh, uh, battles in the Civil War, he granted the company a charter in 1628. The group, which is still in existence today, became the worshipful company of makers of playing cards. The company, which would have been about 27 strong at that time, were then in a position to set about protecting the trade, uh, stopping the imports of French playing cards into the country. So it was a pretty key subject to them. But in return, Charles imposed a tax on every single pack of cards the worshipful company made. It quickly rose to sixpence. That's the equivalent of around five dollars today. Anything that is popular enough and addictive, drinking, smoking, cards were easy to tax and uh, people were addicted to playing cards it, it became very very important and proved to be an excellent income the duty continued to rise eventually reaching two shillings and sixpence or twenty five dollars for a simple pack of cards a tax of two and six it was that was quite a substantial amount it wasn't something that poor people would have been paying readily to try and prevent tax evasion the stamp for the Ace of Spades was held by customs and excise, and every time a member of the worshipful company made a pack of cards, the Ace was only issued once they had paid the duty. But inevitably, 
some card makers still attempted to avoid paying the tax. And in fact, in 1805, uh, Richard Hardin was sentenced to death at the Old Bailey for forging an ace of spades. Which is perhaps why the ace of spades is believed to be unlucky. In other parts of Europe, where the cost of playing cards was much lower, people took advantage of the fact that at this time, only the faces of the cards were printed. Because it was sturdy material, it could be easily uh, used for anything you can do with paper. So the blank backs of playing cards offered all kinds of possibilities, even as a form of currency. This is the very, very first diner's card, even before there was a diner's card. This card is a meal coupon, and it was given out in 1788 to 17 soldiers who went marching from one city in Belgium to another city. So with this card, the soldiers could pay their meal at the innkeeper, and the innkeeper could get his money with this card from the commander. The backs of playing cards were also used for love letters, invitations, and later to hide escape maps during the Second World War. Perhaps their most extraordinary use was in 18th century Netherlands. Poverty drove the poorest women to leave their babies at orphanages. These mothers left messages on the backs of playing cards to give their abandoned children some form of ID. In many cases, the mother used a playing card because a playing card was the cheapest paper they could, they could find. The cards usually carried the name of the child and a heart-rending personal message from the mother. These are all very dramatic cries for help. And we find texts like, um, my daughter is sick and uh, will not eat. And this is a card that says, if God has heard my prayer, Gijs, that's a boy's name in Holland, will not die, I have no more food. And that's all that was written on. If the cards were torn in half, it was a sign that the mother would return one day with her matching half to reclaim the baby. If the card was complete, it meant the child was abandoned for good. So there's a lot of drama in a simple playing card. It is a turbulent tale of religion, politics, and social upheaval. Every pack that survives holds fascinating clues about the life and times of their owners. But there are some who believe the images on the playing card hide a much more sinister purpose, that they are the work of secret societies. By the 18th century, there was no doubting the popularity of the playing card. But with their true origins still unknown, there was mounting curiosity as to what they might really mean. Where did the numbers, the suits, the pictures, the symbols come from? And did they have special significance? It was rumored that this simple plaything contained hidden secrets with mystical and religious connotations, perhaps even relating to the occult. You have this idea of numerology, you have the idea of arcane secrets, you have the idea of, uh, you know, deeply held secrets that, you know, the playing cards may actually give you some kind of answer to. And I think it's very easy to make those connections. With no definitive explanation or guidance, people have tried to divine their own meaning for the numbers in a pack of cards. Perhaps the four suits represent the four seasons, the 52 cards in a pack, the 52 weeks in a year, and the 13 cards in each suit relate to the lunar months. The mathematical theories abound. I think the significance behind um, a lot of the numbers that we see in the suits uh, of playing cards is based on the art of numerology. And the art of numerology basically comes down to the idea that there is arcane and profane knowledge to be found within numbers and the symbolism of numbers and the way that they're presented. And what, what finer place to, to find that than in playing cards? Really? The search for hidden significance evolved by the 19th century into a popular story called the Soldier's Almanac, Bible and Prayer Book. The story goes that a soldier was in church 
And instead of pulling out a Bible, he had a deck of playing cards that he looked at. The priest found that highly offensive. And the soldier said, my playing card deck is my Bible. The soldier went on to explain, the ace reminds me there is but one God. When I look upon a two or a three, I think of the Father, Son, and Holy Trinity. A four reminds me of the four evangelists. A five of the five wise virgins. A six, the six days of creation. And a seven, that on the seventh day, God rested. He went through the whole deck and described the uh, numbered cards and the core cards. Finally, the soldier pulled out the king and turned to the priest and said, when I see the king, it puts me in mind of the great king of heaven and earth, which is God Almighty. Decks of playing cards are very people friendly. You can hold them in your hand. And they're very adaptable. So the fact that the soldier could tell a story that encompassed the Bible and the seven days of creation indicates how flexible they are and how much that they can tell a story. But the soldier's story is not the only attempt to decode the secrets of the numbers and pictures on the deck of cards. Many claims have been made about the hidden and symbolic imagery they may carry. Some believe the secret society known as the Freemasons are involved. The idea of the Masons influencing playing cards is one that you find the Masons influencing pretty much anything. And from certain eras in history, we have Masonic influences being placed upon these. The Freemasons have often been associated with using codes as a means to pass on knowledge and ancient wisdom, but only to each other. Some believe they have concealed secret messages in the imagery of the playing card. For example, it's suggested that a sprig of acacia, which is an important symbol from Masonic rituals, can be seen in the Jack of Hearts hand. There has been some uh, speculation that the jack uh, holding the sprig of acacia has got a Masonic association. And yes, it's true that the sprig of acacia within Freemasonry has got some symbolism to it. Certainly, the leaf of acacia is not an exclusive Masonic emblem. It has also been proposed that the roses held by the Queens are a symbol shared by both the Freemasons and fellow secret society, the Rosicrucians. And the four-armed King of Hearts supposedly represents the ancient Egyptian god Amun, who was also portrayed with four arms. This links to the idea that Egypt is the source of much of the Freemasons' hidden knowledge. I think that we have symbols that are being placed uh, for those who have eyes to see, if you like, but what we don't have, I don't think, is any coherent intention by any particular group to place these symbols upon cards. If there had been any such intention, it would have been far more blatant. And we wouldn't need to sort of try and search on something that might appear to be Masonic in order to find it. A lack of records from the early designers of playing cards makes these myths and rumors hard to prove or to disprove. But their very existence serves to underline the importance of cards in society. Playing cards are symbolically charged objects. They, the suit symbols themselves are reminiscent of heraldry or cabalistic markings. The sort of people who like to look for uh, supernatural symbolism in things are going to find very rich pickings in a pack of cards. Throughout its history, the ordinary playing card has provoked discord and discussion. But this is nothing compared to the debate surrounding one very special pack of cards. One with an even more mysterious past that entwines fortune-telling, mystical symbolism, and the traveling tribes of Egypt, the tarot. No other deck of cards has been surrounded by as much mystery and speculation as the tarot. It's claimed that the pack has extraordinary powers to offer advice and predict the future. And one theory speculates that it was the gypsies who brought the tarot to Europe.
the name Gypsies actually derives from the name Egypt. And the Gypsies were thought of as a wandering tribe of Egypt, if you like. And this is where possibly you get the later idea that a lot of the tarot and a lot of the symbols on the tarot may have an Egyptian origin. And it seems that the Gypsies play a very important role in that idea. But the earliest surviving tarot dates from about the mid-1400s, after the arrival of ordinary playing cards. It was created for the Duke of Milan, Filippo Maria Visconti, believed to be the richest man in Italy at the time. The hand-painted decks were used by the nobility. They were extremely expensive. Each card of each deck was made individually. Historians believe that the tarot was created to expand on the ordinary deck by adding a whole separate series of cards called triumphi or triumphs. The whole point about this extra suit of special cards was that they beat the ordinary cards. They were the trump suits, and that's why they were called originally triumphi. These trumps were a set of 21 cards, each of which had some sort of symbolic picture on it. They were added to a pack of 56 ordinary playing cards, which had four court cards in each suit. A further picture card, known then as the Fool, brought the total number of cards in the standard tarot pack to 78. This enabled the development of more elaborate and complex games, similar to modern-day bridge. The tarot cards, as we know them, were therefore invented for playing games with, not as many people think, for the occult and for fortune-telling. The tarot's appeal meant it spread as rapidly across Europe as the ordinary playing card. But what made the tarot so different was the striking imagery on the trump cards. There is a symbolism. There is something inside that the designers of the tarot early in the 15th century put. Unfortunately, we've lost the keys to understand it. With no definitive explanation for the imagery of the tarot, there has been intense speculation about who might have created or harnessed this symbolism for their own ends. The very mystery of the secret societies, together with the compelling symbolism of the tarot, make them a natural match. And it's not surprising that the um, historians and the people who follow the secret societies would fold the tarot into their legends. One of the most enduring of these legends involves the powerful and mysterious Knights Templar. A group of elite knights formed soon after the First Crusade in the 12th century. The story goes that while in Jerusalem, they discovered the Holy Grail and other religious secrets. And they're bringing back with them from the Middle East items, iconography, art, and belief systems that are completely alien to anything that we'd seen in Europe. It's alleged that tarot cards carry Templar symbols within them. Well, you obviously have the Templar cross. You have the head of Baphomet. The head of Baphomet itself, many people have claimed, influenced the, the devil card. And the Templars, of course, were accused of worshipping Baphomet. Baphomet is a mythical figure, often represented with a goat's head and it's claimed that the knights used it as an idol in their initiation ceremonies. When the Knights Templar were violently suppressed early in the 14th century, some believe their secrets were preserved on the tarot for future generations. The idea of these secret groups inventing the tarot is that they invented it as a way to keep their teachings hidden and yet be able to broadcast them. But these theories are generally dismissed by historians. The Templars had been abolished before the tarot came along. The idea that they went underground and then used the tarot to disseminate their teachings seems very thin. Historians believe the images on the tarot simply reflect the cultural fashions of the 15th century. Renaissance Italy was experiencing an artistic rebirth looking back to classical knowledge and learning for inspiration. The Renaissance was a time when a lot of different streams of thought flowed together. Alchemy, astrology, 
the Jewish Kabbalah was adapted by Renaissance philosophers. The symbols of the tarot were fairly well known to a Renaissance person, even an ordinary person who wasn't educated. They would have been familiar and, and understandable. This symbolism may have been obvious to a Renaissance person, but to modern eyes, many of the images seem a very strange choice. It's quite mysterious why the artist would have chosen to put the skeleton of death in a deck that's supposed to be for fun and gaming. In addition to the skeleton of death, there were other sinister and mysterious images in the tarot deck. The burning tower, the devil, and the hanged man. But this was certainly a well-known Italian image. If someone was shown hanging upside down by the foot, it meant they were accused of being a traitor to the state. Others suggest the meanings are more fundamental, that they are archetypes that have been handed down and just slightly reinterpreted according to the culture of the time. Behind the obvious overt image, there is the message, the, me the meaning of the card, and that is essentially unchanged. They are dealing with the same stuff, and that stuff is the stuff of human consciousness and the way we react to the world in which we are born. They would have images that explained concepts such as vanity, death, love, fortune. But despite their elaborate design, it appears that the tarot cards were mainly used in ordinary games similar to modern-day bridge. Then in the 18th century, the tarot was given a dramatically different interpretation. People started to discover fortune-telling with cards. And tarot cards, obviously, offer more pictures, more clues to fortune-telling. It truly really became extremely popular with card readers and also cultists. It's just a natural that people would pick it up and start seeing fortune-telling in it. The key man behind the use of the tarot to tell fortunes was an 18th century former seed seller from Paris called Aliette. He decided to reverse his name to make it seem more mysterious. Atea, as he was now called, established himself as one of the first and most influential professional fortune tellers. He created what he called a corrected tarot, which he claimed was true to the original tarot that was supposedly from ancient Egypt. Atea assigned several meanings to each tarot card. The devil card, which he called force majeure, could mean extraordinary power or strength. But reversed, it could signal weakness or pettiness. Placed in certain positions in a tarot deal or spread, each card took on a new significance, showing the obstacles existing in life hopes and fears, and even what was to happen in the future. Atea's fortune-telling technique was a major influence on the practitioners who followed, and his tarot deck is still in use today. But in many ways, fortune-telling was just the tip of the iceberg. The tarot had also caught the attention of devotees of the occult, who saw something else altogether the mysterious symbolism of the cards. Today, the tarot has a notorious association with the occult and fortune-telling, but its popularity began just as a trick-playing card game. Then in the late 18th century, two scholars in France, Antoine Cour de Jabelin and the Comte de Melay, tried to read the tarot and understand its symbolism and history. Jablon was a French mason of the late 18th century, and he's the one who really threw tarot into the occult mix. His interpretation of the tarot was heavily influenced by his fascination with ancient Egypt. He wrote a book in which he claimed that the tarot was the Book of Thoth, which had been rescued from the burning library of Alexandria and kept secretly until suddenly it emerged as the tarot. 
The Book of Toth, according to Egyptian mythology, is the book of the God of Wisdom, containing the source of all knowledge. There's no actual proof that this is the case, of course, but there is some suggestion that there may be an indirect influence through Egypt, through Judaism, into Kabbalah. De Gebelin's idea of the tarot being an occult book was quickly taken up by other French occultists, like the writer Eliphas Levi, who pursued the suggestion that the 22 tarot trumps related to the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Levi believed that studying the tarot would reveal the ancient wisdom of the Kabbalah. It does portray a sequence of 22 pictorial images which deal with human archetypes, which deal with the human condition. There is every possibility that it is an encapsulation of ancient knowledge, that it's an arc to carry information through the ages in a relatively inconsequential card game that would survive perhaps the ungentle attentions of the established church, or alternatively, it may simply be an inconsequential card game to which the, an accretion of meaning has gathered over the last several hundred years. But the possibility that the tarot might provide the key, not only to understanding the past, but also to predicting the future, made it extremely seductive. During the 18th and 19th centuries, this interpretation of the tarot spread rapidly across Europe. In England, influential occultists began to design their own decks. Arthur Edward Waite is probably the most well-known tarotist of the 20th century. One of the innovations that he gave to the tarot was featuring illustrations on all of the cards, not just on the courts and the trumps, but also on the numbered cards, so that you can pick up each card of the deck and recognize the image. Arthur Edward Waite's version of the tarot went on to become the preeminent deck in the world and was the inspiration for many others. Alistair Crowley, a one-time student of Waite, created his own special deck. His designs were, are still, radical, revolutionary, redefined what tarot is. And it was done from a position of mastery of the subject. Alistair Crowley worked with the painter Frida Harris to create a highly original occult tarot. The deck itself took five years to paint. The Crowley deck has a completely different mood about it. It's much more brooding and mysterious. It's much more complicated. Some people find it actually um, kind of creepy or, or disturbing. It's powerful. So it will disturb. If it didn't disturb, it wouldn't really have a great deal of value. You could say the same thing about um, filmmaking or pieces of music or pieces of literature. If it doesn't affect you in one way or another, then it's kind of failed in its job, rather. Through 20th century occultists like Waite and Crowley, the tarot became more accessible, attracting a much wider audience. The idea of the uninitiated coming into the, the, the tarot is something actually that, um, that Crowley and, and Waite intended. That's, that was the intention behind their decks. At the same time, you still had to have um, you know, a certain amount of um, vision, I suppose, in order to see what they actually meant. Today, many different occultists use the tarot as a way to broaden and further the study of their own spiritual traditions. They use them for a variety of different purposes, largely for divination, but often as the meditation aids, means of access to different states of consciousness. Each group will probably have its own very specific ideas on how to use them and its own preferred pack. Tarot is an integral part of voodoo practice here in New Orleans.
There was a voodoo priest here in New Orleans. He used to always say, if you want to be a priestess or a priest, you have to be able to hold a snake, dance with a snake, and do divination. Because without divination, how are you going to speak to the spirit? Traditionally, voodoo uses other forms of divination rooted in its West African origins. Cowrie shells, bones, and stones are read to tell the future. Whereas through the shell, you have to ask questions and you receive specific answers, the tarot will actually give you directions. Practitioners use a specially designed voodoo tarot for their readings. People who come to uh, seek a reading or some sort of help, a cleansing, a blessing, they're at a block or crossroad in their life. They need to be reassured. Many times the tarot is a mirror, so they're able to see, to look at themselves and, and look at the situation from various angles. Today, the tarot is regarded as offering guidance into the future, rather than a prediction or prophecy. It's an excellent representation of the universe. Uh, and therefore, it's a sort of microcosmic universe that can be manipulated in a convenient form, and relationships, connections, and so forth between seemingly disparate events and ideas and people and actions can be shown up. So even though you're not telling them what to do and you're not telling them what's going to happen, we are certainly be able to help them make better decisions. It makes people, I think, more feel more in control of their lives. It's information. And it's information about oneself. And that's always fascinating. Although historians believe tarot started as an innocent card game in the 15th century, occultists have bestowed on it a far greater power and significance placing its roots in much more ancient times. They may very well have been the vessels of great secret knowledge that was codified into these symbols, into these cards. Over time, the tarot has absorbed many different streams of thought. What's called the occult tarot added many different layers of meanings to the tarot cards that I don't believe were there originally when the Renaissance artists painted them. Variants on the game of tarot are still very popular in parts of Europe, but its reputation worldwide now has much more to do with its transformation into a spiritual guide used by occult groups or fortune tellers. The tarot can be seen as a game. It can be seen as an occult article that's only for the initiated. I think it's much more enlightening to see it as a reflection of human society as it's transpired over the ages. That's where its true value lies. There are many ways a pack of cards can tell a story. It's both exceptionally complicated and exceptionally simple, which is perhaps the source of the universal appeal of the playing card. It has been unbeatable, I think, and it's a um, small object, very handy, uh, very colorful, you can carry a pack with you anywhere. People love a secret. You, you play a card game, there's maybe four of you, maybe two of you, but only you are involved in what you can see. You hold a secret, and the idea is that you are going to beat your opponents, and people love that. People love being in control, and that's why you'll find that the endurance of, of cards is, uh, is timeless. <laughs> The story of the playing card is a long and captivating journey. With many records lost in time, romantic interpretations of that story have gained a mythical status. So how you decode the playing card depends on how you define them. The playing card can be a game, a trick, an occultist symbol, or the key to the future. That is the magic of the playing card.